We're going to be out of Luke 2, but before we jump into that, I've got to get something off my chest. Um, how many of you have ever had a hard time putting up Christmas lights? <laughs> I hate Christmas lights. I love Christmas lights. I love looking at Christmas lights. But putting them up is a real challenge for me. In fact, so much of a challenge that, uh, that number one, I, you, we've told the story in here before, but I found as an adult that I was allergic to Christmas trees, which is terrible because I love Christmas. I love Christmas trees. But the bright side of that is we got a Costco fake Christmas tree that comes pre-strung with lights, which is beautiful. Uh, the other thing is that um, somehow I've talked my dad into helping. Actually, when I say helping, that's helping because I don't help at all. He does it for me, but I've talked to my dad when he comes down and visits us around Thanksgiving to putting up my lights on my house every year, and now my boys are old enough to learn the trade from my dad, I think I've entirely skipped the idea that I have to put lights up. Because when I try to put lights up, here's what happens. Right here. Right here. Okay. See, here's what happened. First service, people were giving me the evil eye because I was wearing a Chewbacca shirt in church. And I have to tell you why I'm wearing this. All right, wait, I'm going to wait. Somebody's taking a picture. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Selfie. I'm wearing this because this is the weekend that we celebrate joy. Block party last night was a blast. How many of you were there last night? Okay, it was great. In fact, let's, can we give a hand to all the volunteers that helped us last night? It was fantastic. It took a lot of people. It took a lot of people, and the team did a great job. Uh, it, was, it was a great, great event. There were over 3,000 people from the neighborhood that showed up. We gave away over 1,200 gifts uh, to kids and uh, a, a bunch of people that volunteered. Um, last night was part of our joy. Today is part of our joy. This weekend is this weekend we celebrate joy. And when I saw this shirt, I think it was in Target, I stopped and fell on the floor laughing. I thought it was so fun because I feel like a bad Wookiee when I'm trying to put up Christmas lights, and I decided that I was going to get it. And so whenever I dig this shirt out of my drawer every Christmas time, I look at it and start laughing, and it brings me joy. And I know that only 10 of you can identify with me, and the rest of you are judging me for wearing a Chewbacca shirt in church, and I don't care because it makes me laugh. And if it doesn't make you laugh, then maybe you should be a little less religious or something. I don't know. We'll get into that later. Um, listen, uh, the shepherds that we're going to read about, that we did read about already earlier at the Advent candle, and that we're going to read about in a minute, uh, were a lot like Punchinello in this story. Uh, there were a class of people who, if stars were being given out and dots were being given out, the shepherds would have been people who would have gotten no stars and all dots. They would have only been given dots because the shepherds in the first century weren't people that other people wanted to be with. In fact, although the Bible says a lot of good things about shepherds in the Old Testament, the patriarchs were shepherds. Jesus says a lot of things great about shepherds. In fact, he identifies himself and says, I am the good shepherd, which was actually a little bit scandalous because most scholars say in the first century, shepherds were people that nobody wanted to be with. Shepherds were at the bottom, they say, of the socioeconomic class. They were people whose jobs weren't jobs anybody would want because they were poverty level, less than minimum wage jobs. They had to live out in the fields month after month after month after month. They were essentially homeless with nowhere to take a shower, with nowhere to bathe. Uh, they weren't people that you'd want to get close to, both because of the way they live life, but also because they fa for, face it. Let's just be honest. They had to be with sheep 24-7 for weeks at a time. They probably smelled. Shepherds were not people that you aspired to be. It was what you had to be. Sometimes if you ask people in the first century what job was likely to carry the most joy with it. Hey, what thing can you do in life that's going to give you the most joy? No little kid would wake up and be asked, what would you want to do with your life? What do you want to do when you grow up? We get the answer now. What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a politician. Well, nobody says that anymore. Uh, I, I, I want to be a writer. I want to be an actor. Nobody in the first century would have said, you know what's going to give me the most joy is if I could become a shepherd. Yet when we talk about joy at Christmas time, we so often, every year we go back to the shepherds, we go back to this story where the shepherds were encountered by the angel. When we say joy, when we come to this joy weekend, we always find a different uh, angle, a different view, a different lens to look at shepherds from. Why is that? I want to answer that in a minute, but first I want to finish the story that we started earlier when we lit the candle. It's in Luke chapter 2. 
And we left off at verse 14, so I'm going to pick it up in verse 15. It says, When the angels had left the shepherds and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying God and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Heavenly Father, we stop right now and we open up our hearts and ask that you would lead us to the pathway of joy. Lord, you created us to have joy in our lives, our hearts. You created us for joy for eternity. And I pray that today we would see a way to walk that way because so many of us, Lord, don't experience joy. And so we just ask that we would experience that today as we experience your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's three simple things that I want to share with you this morning. It's going to be a short service, and we're going to get to hot chocolate and cookies and everything else. But there's three things that I want to share with you uh, that help us understand how to get on a pathway of joy from both the story we just read in the Bible and also the story we read earlier about the little wooden man, Punchinello. First is this. We're a lot like these little wooden people and a lot like the shepherds. We're a lot like these little wooden people and a lot like the shepherds. Tell somebody next to you, you can either decide to tell them that they're a lot like a shepherd or a lot like a little wooden person. Go ahead and do that. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Don't take offense, all right? We're a lot like these people. Not only do other people place value on us based on faulty information they have about us, but we accept that value. See, in our world, in our culture, people always value us based on what we have, what we don't have, who we know, who we don't know, how much we can accomplish, what we can't accomplish. People value us based on what they see on the outside. And in the first century, people valued or devalued shepherds because they looked at them and they had flawed perceptions of them. They devalued the little wooden Punchinello because they had a flawed perception of who he was. And people devalue us because they have a very flawed perception of who we are. But so often we accept the value that others place on us. And accepting value that others place on us will always kill our joy. Can I say that again? Accepting the value that other people place on you will always kill your joy. Now, of course, you say, well, if people devalue me, if they, if they dismiss me, if they disrespect me, of course that will kill my joy. But what about when people say, oh, what an awesome, wonderful, um, amazing person you are? Won't that build me up? And can I tell you that it might build you up temporarily, but in the end, it still kills your joy if you accept other people's opinions of you? Let me give you an example. How many of you are on social media? Okay, raise your hand if you're on social. Well, look at all the holy people in here that aren't on social media. Okay, if you're on social media, then you know that somebody says something bad about you, obviously that will hurt. But what most people are on social media for is that they look back at their posts and the things that they said, and they look again and again and again and again and again, and they're looking for that first like for that first thumbs up, for that first heart, for that first indication that somebody saw you and noticed you and valued you. And so you keep looking, and now we have a whole generation of people that are addicted to social media because they're looking for value from other people that will say, I see you, I acknowledge you, I declare that you're worth something, and we're looking for our worth everywhere else. And even if people are giving you stars and not dots because of how great you are, how many of you know that you can be great one day and you make one mistake, you make one wrong term, you say one wrong word, you get in somebody's, somebody's way and all of a sudden all the stars are taken away and your life is full of dots. You know what I'm talking about? So we're valued based on what we can produce. We're valued based on what we can do. We're valued based on how we can perform or not perform. And as long as we chase after other people's misappropriated value, we are going to miss God's outlandish opinion of us because people, did you know that God loves you and has an amazing opinion of you? He loves you and cares about you. He loves you and values 
use you for who you are. I have a friend who's a writer, who's a pastor also. He wrote this. Doug Burst said, the Bible starts by talking about, it starts at the very beginning by talking about how wonderfully made we are, how we're made in God's image, how we have been created to be fruitful and to multiply and to be fully alive and how God saw your creation and my creation as very good. That's what God thinks of you. He thinks that you were created to thrive. You were created to be fruitful. You were created to be a part of what he created you for. You were created for purpose and for eternity. And God has placed great value on you. In fact, he values you so much. And we'll talk about it in a minute that he came to earth to die for you. He spilled his own blood for you because he values you and he values your future. Other people don't value us as much as they value what we can do, how we can look, what we can produce. God says, I don't care what you can do, how you look, what you can produce. I care about you. How many of you say that's really good news? That's really good news. When the angels announced the good news to the shepherds who were the lowest class of society, who were at the lowest caste, who didn't have anything to offer, who would have been devalued by everybody else, I think God was saying something about how he places value. If you and I were going to communicate to people the great news, uh, the, the good news of great joy that would be for all people, I think we would look for the highest caste. We would look for the highest level. We would look for the people with a million Facebook followers, right? Because if they then share the news, then it can go to everybody. But God's kingdom and economy is completely backwards in our lives, in our eyes. And so he starts at the bottom and he says, I value those who are not valued by the world. And I believe that if we really believe God loves and values us, regardless of what marks other people place on us, if we understand deeply and truly God's value on us, that will give us joy. Right? So stop there for a second. If you will believe what God says about you, that he loves you so much, that his heart was broken when sin entered the world and broke us, when sin entered the world and took us from relationship with God, when we started walking our own way in rebellion against God, God values us so much that he came running after us. He came to die for us. He came to offer us life and forgiveness from everything that separated us from life with him and joy with him to bring us back into his family. He paid the ultimate price to adopt us into his family. That's how much he loves you and values you. And if you know that, if you know that deep within your knower and deep, deep, deep down within your heart, I'm telling you what, nothing can take your joy away. Let's value ourselves the way God values us. Number two, the other next way to get on the path of joy is this. It says that the shepherds responded with joy after they saw. They saw. Say that with me. They saw. After they saw what they'd heard about. And I want to suggest that the angels weren't the genesis of their joy, that it wasn't the angels that brought them joy. In fact, the Bible says that when they looked up and saw the choir of angels, you know what it says happened? They were terrified. They were scared to death. They were shaking in their boots. They were hiding under their sheep. They were scared. They didn't know what to do with all these angels giving them this great news. But here's what they did after the angels sang the song and spoke the words and gave the great news. They looked at each other, still scared, I think, still a little bit shaking, still a little bit wondering. And they said, let's go figure out if this thing that we just heard is actually true. And they went into Bethlehem and they found Jesus. And it says, when they saw the child, when they saw Jesus and Mary, they returned rejoicing, praising God with great joy. I don't believe it's the angels that gave the shepherds joy. I believe it was the presence of Jesus. Jesus Christ in their lives that gave them joy. When they encountered the King of Kings as a little baby, there was joy, I believe, that came at that moment. Just like when Punchinello saw Eli, the maker, and all of a sudden everything started to turn, I believe that when the shepherds saw the angels and when our, when we see Jesus, when we encounter him in his presence, that's when we get joy. That's the whole reason for Christmas. It's not just so we could hear a story that's 2,000 years old. You guys, that's a great story, right? It's been told a lot of times. It's been told countless of years and generations and, and lots of stories and books and movies and everything else about it. We could listen to the story and go, oh, isn't that great? A baby came. God loved us. That's wonderful that that happened so long ago. The point of Christmas isn't that we focus on something that happened so long ago. The point of Christmas is that we have an opportunity to meet God, our creator 
to meet the one who loves us and created us, that we remember this story that happened, but still active today, God wants to meet us. The word we sang earlier, Emmanuel, means God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. There's another big word, kids, that you can learn around Christmas time, and it's incarnation. Say that word with me. Incarnation. Incarnation means God in the flesh. That God, who is outside of humanity, outside of his own creation, limited himself to human flesh to come so that we could get to know him because we couldn't see God in all of his glory We needed to see him as a human being. Even though he was all God in nature, he also limited himself to humanity. And every year we tell a new story trying to figure out how to explain the incarnation. It's a mystery and it's hard to explain and no story does it justice. But this year I saw something that helped me understand the incarnation that I love probably more than any other story that I've heard. Do you want to hear it? Okay. I'm not going to tell you. No, just kidding. I'll tell you. (laughs) Some of you know that every year our family uh, does a Christmas card and we send the card out to a lot of you and and if you don't get it, get it, tell us and we'll send you a card, we'd love to. Um, And part of that Christmas card is pictures of our family and it's a verse and things we have to say. But part of it is that our three kids for years, I don't know when it's going to stop, probably soon because, you know, we're starting to get adults in our household. But for years they would draw or they would photograph or they would represent a nativity scene. And the three kids would draw a unique nativity scene. Now, in the few days, some of you, many of you are going to get our Christmas card. And I love all three uh, expressions of the nativity this year. They're all very unique. But one of my favorite ones for years and years is one this year that Johnny, my son Johnny, drew this year. He drew Mary and Joseph and Jesus as clowns. (laughs) As clowns. I'm going to let that settle in for a minute. Some of you are nervously laughing. Is that okay? Can we do that? Is that theologically correct? What in the world? And we start getting scandalized by this idea that maybe Jesus came as a clown. But I want to tell you, I love this picture. How many of you know, some of you would know this, some of you wouldn't know this, that my very first job that I made money at, I was 12, 13 years old, and me and my best friend at the time decided that we wanted to start our own business. Actually, before, I was, before that, I had a paper route and did some other things, but my first business, my first entrepreneurial venture was me and my best friend started a clown business. We did. We started a clown. You're like, I knew my pastor was a clown. I knew that. We started a clown business at 12 years old, at 13 years old. We actually went to little kids' birthday parties and we, like, were, we thought, we, I mean, I was young and I, all I knew of clowns was that they were happy. Now, some of you, when I said the word clown, you got really scared. I found that people have a phobia of clowns. They don't like clowns. But later on in life, I found out I ran into a clown one time that wasn't that happy. Can you believe that? He was a French clown. (laughs) <laughs> and he was one of those sad clowns and you go what's a clown doing that's sad I don't understand this clowns are supposed to be happy and joyful and then you find out that some clowns are scary and some clowns are sad and then you look at humanity and you realize that we're not a bunch of happy clowns people that's true. we're actually a bunch of kind of sad and scary French clowns <laughs> If you're French, forgive me. I, 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 I love you. It's okay. But I realize, I realize that the incarnation was God making himself available to us in our skin, in our clothes, in a way that we can understand. And I just want to be honest with you. When I look at humanity, sometimes I just think we're a bunch of clowns. Right? Can anybody agree with me? I want to say something else now. If you're scandalized by the idea of Jesus as a clown then you're totally understanding the incarnation. Because when the Bible talks about God in all of his glory limiting himself to human frailty, that was scandalous. That was completely scandalous. When somebody read about that, they go, wait a minute. It, God can't do that. God in all of his glory can't come limit himself to a frail, broken human being, to a human being that could bleed and die. God isn't going to do that. And it was scandalous. Just like we would think of Jesus as God coming as a clown. And so I look at this picture of Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and I realize that God shows up as a human clown, I mean human being, full of true joy in the person of Jesus. 
And he came to a bunch of us sad clowns, and he showed us the way to meaningful, eternal, joy-filled life, and he died to free us from the grip of everything that gives us a lack of joy. Because I want to tell you that sin is always bringing death to our lives. When we turn away from God and we walk away from him, we're embracing and walking toward death. And God loved us so much and he valued us so much that he came, he became one of us so that we wouldn't run away and go, I don't want to see you, God. You're too big. You're too mighty. You're too awesome. That we would, in the person of Jesus, as a human being, be able to turn around and have a relationship with God. I believe that true joy happens when we see Jesus for who he is. So when we see us for who we are, the identity God's given us, the value he's given us, that gets us on the pathway to joy. But that's not enough because we need to see God for who he is. We see Jesus Christ in all of his divinity, but also in all of his humanity. And we recognize that he died on the cross so that we could put away everything that killed our joy and embrace eternity and joy with him. And that's good news, right? That's the way to joy. And if we keep our eyes on him, he can give us a happiness that can't be taken away by any circumstance. Just like the shepherds were communicated on that, that first night when they were living out in the fields by night, when they didn't have any resources, when they, when, when they weren't people that anybody would care about, when they were people that were being put dots on. Jesus said, I want to give you joy that transcends all of that. And you might be here today and you might not have a whole lot of joy. And you think, Pastor Tim, even wearing a Chewbacca shirt isn't going to give me any joy today. <laughs> But I want to tell you, you don't have to wear a certain shirt or decorate a certain way or listen to a certain song. I want to tell you right now, God wants to give you joy that totally passes any understanding that you have. He wants to give you a joy that doesn't come because you decorate or you sing or you give the right gift or you get the right gift. He wants to give you a joy that transcends all of that. Number three. Once we know what our value is before the Lord and we can embrace that, and once we know that we can encounter Jesus and recognize that he wants to give us joy through relationship with him, a multiplier of that joy is helping other people recognize their true value by pointing them to Jesus. And the story that Joanna read, Lucia, the little wooden girl whose stickers wouldn't stick on her, the dots and the stars just fell off because she had a relationship with her creator. She enjoyed, enjoyed pointing Punchinello to Eli and saying, you need to go up the hill and you need to meet the creator. There was great joy that happened in his life, but I believe also in her story, in her life, and I believe that because I also see it in the shepherd's. In the shepherds, the, the, in the Bible, the shepherds told everybody about Jesus. Everybody. The shepherds are told this good news that would bring great joy for all people. How many people? Oh. Not just the shepherds' friends, not just their family. They wanted to share this great joy that would be for oh. all people. And all people, they were excited to go tell them. And after they spread the news to as many people as they could, it says they returned to their jobs, they returned to their fields, glorifying and praising God. Because I want to tell you, you may come to church and you may not feel like praising God and you just make it a choice. And Christians, that sometimes is necessary. We don't feel it in our emotions, but we choose to praise God because he's worthy to be praised, right? Okay. But I want to tell you also, there's something that will give you the kind of joy where you're not going to have to choose to praise God. You're going to just praise God because of the overflow of what he's doing in your life. And that thing is this. When you start spreading the good news about people's true value and identity, and you start spreading the good news about Jesus who wants to encounter people and when people turn their lives around and they get healed in their life and they embrace the eternal life and joy that God has to give them because of what you told them, you can't help but praise God. You can't help but get excited. These shepherds were going back to their dead end job and yet they were floating 10 feet off the ground, excited, it was here that God was in the flesh, that God was living with us, that they could encounter this God because he came to us. That will give you joy. Listen, last night was a blast. If you were here, we had so much fun. We were dressed up. We were hanging out with people from the neighborhood and from the city. And there were so many people at the gate that kept asking us, how much is it going to cost? And we said, it's free. And it was awesome to see these little kids break out into a smile. They could come and get a picture with Santa Claus. They could come and get a free gift. They can come and ride trains and ride ponies. I mean, uh, reindeer. And they could come and play games. And they 
make it come and hang out because the love of Jesus was all over the place and the love of Jesus is free and we were able to encounter people. And last night was a blast, but my favorite story from last night was this, that there was a guy that had just gotten out of prison and he got dropped off somewhere near the church and he found his way to this party that was happening and he was walking around and he found somebody and said, what's going on here? And the person explained what was going on and the next question out of his mouth was, could you tell me how to find God? <laughs> and so in the parking lot at the church on the way on December 14th, 2019, that somebody prayed with this guy who just got out of prison to receive Jesus in his heart and to follow him. Yeah. Now that'll give you joy. When you and I share the reality of a God who loves us and who values us and who died for us and who wants to know us, who actually left all of the glory and the privilege of God and he came down to be like us, I'm telling you, when you start realizing that, you're going to start praising God. If you want to do something that gives you joy that can't be taken away, once you've seen God and you know what he thinks about you and you spread this news of great joy to all the people, including those who you think might be unreachable, people that you think, oh, they don't want to hear it. Oh, they don't really want to know this message. Oh, they're tired of church. Oh, I don't want to be too religious. I don't want to make them feel like I'm trying to push it down their throats. And by the way, don't push stuff down their throats. They, listen, the, the shepherds didn't have a Bible college degree. They didn't know how to evangelize. They didn't know the right words to say. You know what the shepherds said? Hey, look, we heard something cool from an angel and there it is right there. They heard it, they saw it, they said it. Amen. All you need to do is hear it and see it and say it. And you may not know how to share the good news of grace and God and, and his life and his love. And you don't know the words to put together. Maybe for you this week, it's going to simply be this. Hey, you go talk to a neighbor and you say, listen, I, I don't even know how to explain it. But I want to tell you that the place that I go to worship on Sundays, God is there. And if you come with me this week on, the, on our Christmas Sunday, the 22nd, or if you come on Christmas Eve with me, I, I, think, I think God could, could do something in your life. I think you're going to encounter God. And you may think that's the corniest thing ever, but I'm telling you, somebody in your life needs to know that they can meet God. Amen. And I'll tell you what will bring you the most joy in the world is if you can share not the judgment and the punishment and the, and the shame that people associate with, oh my goodness, I'm so bad. I've done so many horrible things. I've said so many horrible things. God would never accept me. But they would understand that his judgment is reserved for the sin that breaks our lives. And he wants to take that away because he loves us so much. He wants us to spend eternity with him. Amen. So people think they're hearing something. You think you're saying one thing, but you need to, as we share the love of God, as we invite people into the presence of God, God has the ability to change their lives. Amen. Not because of a great worship team, not because of a great sermon, not because of a great building, but simply because his presence is here and he wants to encounter people. Amen. Can we pray? Lord, we love you, we worship you, and we thank you. We thank you that Hebrews 12, 2 says that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross, scorning its shame. And the joy that was set before you was the salvation of your people, was the fact that you would invite us into your family, that you would adopt us into your family. God, you created us for eternity, and our lives don't end at the end of our physical lives. And so you came to us, God with us, Emmanuel, the incarnation, you came and put on human flesh. That, that blows me away. Every time I think about it, God, it blows me away. That you, God in heaven, who created the whole universe, who sustains the whole universe, who is so outside of time and outside of flesh and outside of our temporal reality, you came and limited yourself to that because you loved us so much. That's the story of Christmas. You came because you valued us. You encountered us because you want us to know you, not just know a story. And I pray that we would, first of all, receive that for ourselves. And second of all, Lord, that maybe in a feeble way, maybe we don't have all the words down. Maybe we don't have it all figured out, but we would just share the reality of God in us, God with us, God through us, Emmanuel, with other people. Lord, so not just that our joy can be full, but so that their joy can be full too. Lord, the enemy in the world wants to rip our joy off. God, we want to embrace the joy that you have to give us. We want to follow you. Would you just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed? And um, you might be here and maybe you know the Lord, but you've lost the joy of your salvation. 
the Bible in the Psalms, there's a prayer that says, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And maybe you've become um, small-minded. Maybe you've become over-religious. Maybe you've become uh, small-hearted. And somewhere you've lost the joy of just the passion of the fact that Jesus loves you and he came to die for you and love you and give you eternal life. And you've lost that joy. You've lost that sense of happiness in your salvation. And you would want to respond to him. Again, I want to give you a moment to respond to the Lord and say, Lord, would you, would you restore to me the joy of my salvation? Would you restore to me the joy of this Christmas season, of this Christmas story? Restore that to my heart today. Just do that in your own heart right now. And as you're praying before the Lord, you may be here in this room and you don't know Jesus. You've never given him your heart. You've never turned to him. And, and you would say, I still have a lot of questions. I'm sure the shepherds still had a lot of questions when the angels spoke joy to them and spoke good news to them. And yet they went to see for themselves what they had heard. And by seeing Jesus encountering him, everything changed. And you may still have a lot of questions this morning, but you would want to see Jesus and open up your heart to him and say, Lord, I want to see you. I want to give you my life. I want to open up to that eternal joy that you offer to me. If you don't know Jesus and you want to say yes to him, you're coming to the cross, you're recognizing that he died for all of the brokenness that humanity has embraced and he wants to give you wholeness and eternal life. Or maybe you have followed him, but you turned around and you walked far away and the Lord today would say, come back to me, child, son or daughter, come back to me, come back to me. Turn around, I'm right here to embrace you. If you've never said yes to Jesus and you want to say yes to him or you want to say yes to the Lord again today and turn around and come back to him, would you just put your hand up and look at me? I want to agree with you today that Jesus wants to encounter your life. I see you right back there. I agree with you and you. Who else on my right or your left? Anybody else? Okay, I see you right there and there. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, right here. I agree with you. Over here, right in the back, little one in the very back row. I agree with you. And right here in the middle, right here, I agree with you. Just look at me and wave if, if I'm missing you. Say, that's me. That's me. I want to say yes to Jesus. Both of you sitting right there together. I see you guys. Who else would be here? And you'd say, yeah, I see you right there. Yeah, who else? Wave at me. Let me see you. I want to agree with you. I saw you guys. I agree with you right here. Yeah. Yeah, I see you. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I see you. Amen. Lord, I don't know that I've seen every single hand that's up, but I know that you saw every heart. You saw every heart that opened to you. Lord, hearts that opened to you, even watching online and streaming. God, they don't have to be in the room to turn their hearts to you. I pray that there would be a sense of your supernatural joy that would overwhelm all of us today as we come to you and open up our hearts to everything that you have to do in us. Lord, today as we leave this place, give us your joy that comes from knowing how much you value us and that comes from understanding, Lord, how to engage and encounter you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Encounter you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. 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 God bless you.